Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the 14th in our series of COVID seminars by health professionals for health professions. How time flies, or indeed doesn't. And I thought now to bring a little more frisson of excitement for our many speakers. Uh, and I think from now on, I'm going to try and, and have a, a band word for each uh, of our seminars. And so uh, Natasha and Martin, I'm going to, if you either of you use the word new normal, in the next half hour, I'm going to switch you off. So new normal is now banned from now on. So today's seminar then, what a stellar cast we have to talk about matters European. Professor Martin McKee, one of, no, the leading epidemiologist and public health expert we have, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where he holds the chair of European public health. He has over 1400 papers, 60,000 citations, 30 already this year, and indeed, that doesn't even include the one that he published in our journal, JRSM, just a few days ago on developing a sustainable exit strategy. Makes you sick. And then we have Dr. Natasha Asapari Muscat, and those of you who recognize Maltese names will know that that is a Maltese name. A very distinguished public health physician, former CMO of Malta, bet you're glad you aren't now, and leader of her profession across Europe, now the senior advisor, the regional director of WHO Europe. You are both very welcome. So now I want to plan to kick off, first of all, with what I think does sound a bit like a boring bottling question, but I think it's the one we have to start with, hopefully reasonably swiftly, before we can get on to the more exciting questions about what's happening and why. But it's this one, it's already been asked and already, and the Nicolaides has already come up, that's very quick, which is this. And the basic question is just how valid are cross-country analyses at the moment of illness, of mortality, and so on? How valid are we to, e or to even try to make those analyses? Martin, do you want to lead off? Sure. We make comparisons of countries all the time. So, for example, every um, year, whenever um, the uh, Chancellor gets up to uh, give the budget speech, he'll often make references to the level of economic growth, GDP, for example. And that's easily available, widely used, and yet seriously problematic. So that's an example of a comparison that we use all the time, but it's valid to some extent, but it's not perfect. And the same is true of many health statistics as well, including the statistics around the coronavirus. They give us a big, a big picture, but if we're going to try and say, is one just a little bit higher than the other, one country doing a little bit better than the other, or a little bit worse, that's not helpful. But when there are massive differences, it tells us a lot. So Natasha, you sit at the kind of epicenter, well, you're in Malta at the moment, but you ought to be in Geneva, and WHO's job, surely, is to make these comparisons. What else is it there for? But what particular pitfalls would you highlight? What are the kind of risks of that game? Thank you, Simon. Well, I mean, I think today everybody is going to be comparing and benchmarking all the time. And as you said, perhaps it's because I'm from a small country and there's not so much scope, for example, for regional um, comparisons that we have always tended to look out and compare to other countries. Building on what Martin was saying earlier, one of the things that we often do to ensure that as much as possible, what we are looking at is really um, a solid, uh, set of data is to look at more than one indicator. So I think the first piece of advice is not to just focus on one indicator, but to use perhaps a suite of indicators to build the story. I'm actually, as you said, now working for WHO uh, Euro. And uh, since yesterday, I'm appointed as Director for Health Policies and Systems at a very challenging time. So yes. some people have actually asked me, um, uh, why have you uh, joined WHO um, at this moment when, when it's so critical and so challenging? I think more than ever before, um, COVID itself has made us realize how much no country can tackle such health threats on its own. And whilst, of course, it's very heartening, for example, to hear um, France and Germany saying that they uh, think it's high time for the EU to have a health strategy, something that um, in our previous capacities, Martin and myself um, within the European Public Health Association have been lobbying for and pushing for for the past years. 
An organization like WHO always has health as its, as its mandate, not only okay. in a time of crisis. Okay, well, I'm not sure if we should congratulate or commiserate with you on your new task, um, but sticking with the present one, um, I've also heard it said in the UK, <clears throat> well, by many people actually, that to be honest, I mean, there's a question here just come in from Cat Lewis, and I'll read out, it says, uh, how many years will, will it be until we know what was the right strategy? I feel like my five-year-old will be studying this at GCE before we know, and that would mean 11 years. Um, so how, how long will we actually be able to make comparisons? Some people say, you know, it's not fair, we'll all end up in the same place, but at different rates. Do you, do you want to pick up that one, Natasha, and then I'll bring in Martin. Yeah, um, things happened very, very rapidly, Simon. I think this is something which um, a lot of people who are very normally comfortable moving only when there is really solid and robust evidence mm -hmm. found themselves very much learning as they were going along. And sometimes the only thing that they had to learn from was the actions that other countries who were further ahead on the curve were taking. Um, and trying to observe the impact of those actions. The early countries, China and Italy, and the way in which they reacted, um, as well as some of the other countries in, in Asia, I think did uh, have quite an impact on, on the actions that, that governments eventually took um, in order to do what they thought was best at the time. Probably, even when they were um, deciding to use lockdowns, which was a very blunt, um, if you wish, instrument, but the one that was uh, at the time for, for several countries who were short of ventilators, PPE, who were mm -hmm. sure when this was coming, was, it was the, the, the uh, safest thing which was seen to be done. Now we are learning that moving out of these lockdowns, restarting the economy, um, is not as easy as one may may have thought it to be. Yes, um, you, 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 you answer very diplomatically and I can quite understand, you know, if you get something wrong, then Donald Trump takes all your budget away. So I, I can see that. Martin, you don't have to be quite so diplomatic. Well, um, tell, to, you, what's your answer to the same well, question? Well, you know, it's always attempting at a time like this to invoke Chu and Lai or the statement that is uh, attributed probably incorrectly to him about the French Revolution, that it was uh, too soon to make an assessment. But I think we can already say quite a lot. We can certainly say that there are lots of things that different country, countries have done that have been wrong. Now, the more difficult to say are the things they did that we think may have been right to actually turn out to be right in the long term. But uh, you've already mentioned President Trump. Uh, we simply need to compile his tweets and we have a rich anthology of things that nobody should do. And we have similar problems in Brazil and in Tanzania uh, and in a number of other countries too. Okay. That said, uh, there are issues about whether um, you know, when we should have moved to, to lockdown, when we should ease the restrictions. I think we already have a pretty good idea, but there are still quite a lot of areas of uncertainty. And we've been learning very rapidly. We've been learning a lot about the transmission of this virus, quite different from influenza. And so much of our evidence was taken from influenza. And this may be why the Southeast Asian countries have done much better, because they had a paradigm when they said pandemic, their word association was SARS, whereas ours was influenza. But we're also realizing this is a complex multi-system disease and our ability to treat it has been evolving very rapidly too. Okay, just, just, just a pedant in me. Chow and Lai, poor man, he said that in 1969. He actually was referring to the French Evenements of 1968. So what was always that was thought why to be I said a attributed Totally yeah. profound prophecy. It was actually not profound Indeed, at all. Indeed, I know, but it's often said. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, well, uh, Cat Lewis raised the question of schools, and this is a huge issue now over here, highly tempestuous. Martin, did we close the schools too late, and are we trying to open them too early? First of all, we need to realize this is a complex challenge. Everybody, I think, agrees that children should be in a nurturing, supportive learning environment, if at all possible. However, we also have a responsibility to the children, to their parents, to the teachers and to the support staff, all of whom need to be protected. My concern in the United Kingdom at the minute 
is that I'm not convinced that we have got the testing system, the contact tracing system in place, or will I don't think we will have it in place for the 1st of June. So that's a real concern. And if that's not the case, then there's a danger that schools effectively become places to store children, where we have them sitting in their chairs and not able to move out of it, not able to interact, not able to exchange marking books with their school teachers and so on. So I think that there is a responsibility on government to do rather a lot to make it safe for the schools to reopen, but I don't see that we're here there yet. Okay. Natasha, your view from, let's pretend you're in Geneva, looking across Europe. Well, um, Copenhagen, actually, you, Simon, because it's... Copenhagen. It's <laughs> um, okay. Far more interesting place in Geneva. Uh-huh. Um, so, okay. Very emotive. Schools is one of those issues which, when you talk about several other settings, doesn't raise the emotion that it raises mm-hmm. with schools. And schools is also critical because it affects so many other decisions around the economy. What um, I think we can say is that some countries, particularly some of the Nordic countries that have started reopening schools, so far have not seen any adverse impact. But one always has to take the context very much into account. And a Greek colleague some time ago had actually said, you know, um, reopening schools in Greece, where we still have a lot of people who live in households with extended family and grandparents, will automatically imply that you're going to be exposing perhaps some rather vulnerable people um, in a way that may have not been intended. So this is always very, um, I think, also culturally and contextually specific. But allow me to add to a point that Martin brought up, which is around the capacity for testing, contact tracing, etc. Unfortunately, what we tend to see sometimes is that, that people believe that once the crisis is over, the surge capacity that we may have put into our public health services, which was quite easy to do because we shut down other parts of the health system, starts to be removed in this transition period as we start to reopen other parts of the health services. So at a time when we really need to be more vigilant, more comprehensive, more timely with our testing and our contact tracing, we are tempted then to withdraw the resources thinking that the crisis is over. And this is very, very short-sighted. And I would really make a plea to make sure that as we move more into transition and easing of measures, if anything, you need to continue to surge and beef up your public health capacity. Simon, can I just jump into maybe expand on that a bit? Because in Denmark, there have been a few small outbreaks, but not very much. But they started, they opened the schools up whenever the uh, prevalence in the population was at a much, much lower level than it is in the UK and with a much more robust testing and tracing system. So they were able to respond. Now in France, and I saw somebody did actually uh, raise a question in the chat there, as they say, there have been 70 cases linked with schools that were reported in the news item today. And uh, there has been a concern that, you know, we really need to look at what is happening. But I think before we do open that up, we really need to do what we call, we would in other circumstances say, is scenario analysis. What happens if you do have a child who is fine to have COVID on a Friday? And can we work through who the, the head teacher contacts, who they talk to, do they have the telephone numbers, is somebody on duty? And actually work through almost like a sort of war gaming type thing. And if we look at what's happened with, for example, the uh, food vouchers for children on free school meals, where we have head teachers saying they're getting up at two o'clock in the morning to log on to a website and hanging on for hours on the phone. Uh, this is the real challenge I think we face in the UK with this highly centralized model of everything run out of call centers rather than having the local authorities, the traditional public health departments doing it from the ground where people can be contacted. And as in France, you would just go to the local mayor, but in the UK, you have to get on a a computer and uh, go on the internet to somebody miles away. And also perhaps in Denmark, um, uh, initially people were very reluctant to send their children back to schools. So the re-entry was far more gradual then, um, uh, so I mean, one, it's one thing to see at the macro level schools reopen, but if you go, go into the more granular detail, you see that actually in the initial, in, in the initial days, particularly, 
parents were rather reluctant, so the schools so the were school not full of children. I think, I think that's the case here as well. Even if we did open all the schools tomorrow, um, it would not be that every child goes back to school. It would be quite a small proportion. And I think that's going to be the case of any measures that uh, whatever happens, it will be slow. Now, several, several, of point, several people are always intrigued by Malta and uh, they're pointing out that Malta has done very well in managing this epidemic. David Vassallo asked, and I saw a couple of other ones. I, it just seems to me that, that the, the smaller countries, um, you know, Bulgaria, Slovenia, um, I bet Melania Trump wishes she was back home, by the way. There are all sorts of reasons, but places like Slovenia, uh, New Zealand has been mentioned, um, Austria, and so on, do seem to do better than larger countries, USA, Italy, France. Do you think this is purely random? or actually you are much better off in a small country? I think one has to be careful because we also know that there are small countries that have had quite high incidences. Um, uh, well, Luxembourg, um, Iceland, but that goes back again to the fact that they tested so, so much. So mm. the high numbers are a reflection very much of, of the testing too. In small countries, particularly islands, we have seen islands being protected. Even in Italy, for example, Sicily and Sardinia have been slightly more protected. Um, there has been perhaps the, the ability to be a bit more effective, immediate and comprehensive. Um, um, but uh, I think it's a bit early to say. And also with, with small countries, um, numbers can shift very, very rapidly. I mean, if you take a look at the WHO uh, dashboard um, uh, today for Malta, it's red because yes. we had a, a more or less doubling in, in numbers. But we've also almost doubled our testing capacity because it was something that we felt we had to do going into the transition. So um, what, is, what is quite clear is that in a smaller country, perhaps the reach, the contact tracing, maybe in some cases also the community resilience networks really being able to cocoon your vulnerable people because everybody's going to be able to deliver goods and make sure they stay inside there's obviously a lot to unearth and uncover but i wouldn't um, put it down so simply to to size one would also need to see um, at which point their first cases were imported and how they actually responded, the rapidity with which they responded. If you look at the, at the Western Balkans, for example, where they had huge numbers of re returning diaspora from mm -hmm. Italy, and they knew that they didn't have the ventilators, the PPE, they responded in a very early and aggressive manner um, with uh, uh, very, very strict curfews, very, very severe measures. So mm -hmm. I think it was a question, perhaps, of timing also. Okay. Martin? There is an element of luck in all of this with islands. So yeah. if we think back to the very basic of the first epidemiology, looking at measles, Panam's work in the Faroe Islands, showing how a ship coming in that just happened to have measles on it could go through the population. Now, of course, that was a long time ago. But more recently, we had the 2019 um, outbreak of measles in Samoa, which in fact replicated something that had happened about 100 years earlier when the German ship went into to harbour there. So uh, you, I think the islands, we're getting out of Europe now, but certainly the islands of the Pacific have been relatively unscathed, um, have been relatively safe in all of this, but that I think uh, it could easily have been otherwise. And there are, uh, I mean, some small countries have been quite badly affected. Uh, some of the countries in Eastern Europe, Poland, for example, is a large country and it has done relatively well. Okay, fair enough. So th then, Let's then have to another question saying, across Europe then, how should we be preparing for the second wave, which frankly someone has said we all know is coming? It, first of all, would you agree that, that we do all know it's coming? And second, what, what's the WHO helping, or how is the WHO helping to, to um, deal with, or respond to the second wave? Do you, do you want to start off with that one, Martin? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I've read, obviously read the documents, but I'm not at the, uh, the heart of the decision making process. Uh, so I think <laughs> both the World Health be. Organization and the European Union have an important role to play. Uh, the uh, WHO is function primarily collecting data, of course, setting norms and technical standards, and uh, it has been uh, facilitating the exchange of information. I will do a little bit of a plug for the European Observatory, which I'm very 
research director. We have a COVID um, national response monitor, which is tracking what's been happening. Uh, the observatory is a partnership, including the European Commission and the World Health Organization. And you can see what different countries are doing there. There's quite a lot that needs to be done within the European Union uh, and Ursula von der Leyen, the um, President of the Commission, has been pushing for uh, greater powers because the reality is that public health has always been very much guarded as a national responsibility and member states have been reluctant to uh, come together. That is now beginning to change and we are seeing change moves by Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel to say, well, we actually do need to get um, more powers there so that we can coordinate in the future. Okay. I mean, Natasha, Germany, German states have, have all agreed an emergency break. I think it's, if they have more than 50 cases per 100,000 inhabitants, that's the rule they're setting, that they will then start to reimpose restrictions. Is it sensible to have kind of hard and fast rules or should you do it differently in different places? So perhaps to go back to is a second wave coming and how WHO is preparing. Um, uh, some time ago, the regional director, Dr. Hans Kluge, in an interview to The Telegraph um, was uh, quoted very much for saying this is a time for preparation, not for celebration. So I think the key message is we need to really remain vigilant and prepared. And what we did is we published um, this uh, document, series of considerations in transitioning. And, and here we set out how um, countries need to examine what worked well in this first wave, what didn't work so well, find the mm. gaps, plug the holes, prepare themselves uh, better in terms of infection control, in terms of keeping people away from hospitals, which are amplifiers of infection, strengthening primary care, um, using digital um, in a safe and manner that respects privacy to complement um, contact tracing. Okay. There's all that in there. But one of the things that we do emphasize about the transition is that there needs to be a readiness to have it going in a bi-directional manner to be very open and transparent with the public about the triggers and the levers. So now whether the German regions were a bit too strict in saying if it's uh, more than 50, and it's 51, but I think it does give um, a sense of kind of openness and transparency to the public about the levers and the triggers that you intend to use. And this situation is not going to go away quickly. And keeping the public's trust and keeping the public on board, keeping the public committed, is really going to be a critical factor for success. And I think this entails transparency, consistency, um, a continuous listening and surveying of public opinion, feelings, understanding, perception, and being able to respond in a way that respects also um, um, that, that communication and connection with the public. Now, if the way to do that is to say, these are the criteria that I am setting, and if we don't reach that, then we're going to put the emergency break, we're going to pull back. It may almost be better than sort of um, taking the population by the element of surprise which I think um, in these situations does not help to build yeah. confidence. So you raised That's a very fair point. Martin, we're getting a lot of people obviously want, want you and others to come down off the fence a little bit then. So but be straightforward. Do you think that Sweden and or Germany have done this better than us or is it still just a matter of luck? I think Germany has done a lot better than we have. I, I have a lot of reservations about the Swedish situation. You know, I know some of the people involved in making those decisions and uh, their argument has been that this will help us to move towards herd immunity and it will perhaps have uh, mean that there's less of an impact in the second wave. Well, the, the reality is from the antibody studies that are being done, typically in the general public, we're getting rates of about 5% so far. Uh, maybe in some parts, like in one part of southern Germany, one town that was very badly affected, up to about 15%. But we're not seeing that happening. And uh, we are now, we've seen death rates that are much higher in Sweden than they have been in Denmark, and particularly much higher than in Norway. 
Germany was very fortunate. It has a rich infrastructure in public health um, and uh, in, in its capacity, particularly for laboratory testing and tracing, and was able to move quickly in a way that the United Kingdom struggled with because, of course, uh, what had been a very strong system has been significantly eroded in recent years. But of course, Angela Merkel, widely praised for her leadership in this area, um, she said on March 11th that she expected 70% of the German population would become infected with the coronavirus. Seems to me that she was thinking of uh, moving towards uh, herd immunity. She's not a doctor, but she's a scientist. Mm -hmm. Do you think she's managed to change her mind and get away with it in a way that some of our leaders haven't? Perhaps. Uh, she certainly has inspired a very high degree of confidence. And if we look at mm. the figures for the, the opinion polls that the CDU are doing very well at the minute and actually taking away support from some of the extreme parties, particularly uh, AFD, uh, which has its own problems because, of course, it's now splitting geographically, but that's another issue. Uh, but yeah. uh, certainly she is uh, commanding a very high level of public trust and respect. But, but uh, my point is that Germany, presuming the Chancellor is important in mm. setting strategy, must have started with the view that the quicker we get to 70%, the better. Well, she may have, but that's certainly not the policies that seem to be adopted. Oh. Because they were very active in suppressing the disease and not letting it do that. Okay, so Mutti wasn't wrong. It wasn't, wasn't always right then, as the Germans would say. I mean, you're a bit critical of Sweden. Um, a lot of people are quite impressed with what Sweden's doing. Maybe it's not doing as well as the other Scandinavian nations, but it's still doing better than we are. Or is that just you think that that's an illusion? I think a lot of people want to know maybe. what do you what's your criticism of Sweden? Well, if we look at the shape of the curve, I think uh, we may well find uh, it is not doing so well. Actually, I, I think that is all a matter of where we are at the stage in the epidemic. Scandinavia was affected later than uh, some of the other countries. But I, I think the other point to emphasize is you were asking much earlier about what we can learn from international comparisons. Yeah. In some of the countries in Europe, we can learn a lot from comparisons within countries because Italy, Spain and France have all been really quite successful in confining the epidemic to parts of the country. If you take this measure of 50% uh, excess all-cause mortality as an indicator of where it's not working. Well, if that's the case, then in Italy, it was really only Veneto, Lombardy, Emilia-Romagna and Piedmont, and very, very little in the rest of the country. In Spain, it was largely Madrid. In France, it was the Ile de France and Alsace, whereas we're seeing a much more generalized epidemic here. And also, that's a really good point, Natasha. Yes, also just to add on to what Martin was saying, even for example between Veneto and Lombardy, comparisons have been made. Veneto and Lombardy were the two regions that were first affected and Veneto took an approach that was far more focused on keeping people away from hospitals because it had a good primary care infrastructure and people think that this helped very much going forward too. I mean, two things come from that, to, to, we're moving towards the end, but is that um, Firstly, national boundaries are very arbitrary, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're due to historical processes, military success, defeat, all sorts of things. Do you think that we actually, because we, we report things by nations, that we get misled sometimes and the epidemiology and the virus doesn't follow um, those boundaries at all? Well, I mean, virus, might... viruses don't know borders. That's, exactly. that's very, very, very clear. Um, um, but uh, as Martin was saying, looking at larger countries and looking at where the impacts really were, I think also, for example, take a, a country like Austria, which is a, a middle-sized country, but they're, even as they start to transition, large parts of Austria went down to almost single-digit numbers in a very short period of time. And at the moment, the pockets that they are still seeing are in Vienna and in, in particular communities that tend to be communities that are rather deprived. And this is a, a point that we haven't been able to touch on really, the links between COVID and, and NCDs and deprivation. But I think go, going forward, these are also very, very important lessons learned in terms of how our, our health systems and our societies really um, uh, deal with, with all of this situation, lots but, of package. Now, you, you mentioned a stronger primary care system in Veneto than in, than in Lombardy. Now, Martin, you would agree that, that we have, a, I'm not just saying this because of my wife, but we have a strong primary care system in the UK. We're really rather proud of it. Why has then that not protected us? 
I, uh, I would agree. I should say my brother, who I believe is watching this, is a general practitioner. My parents were general practitioners. Uh, so That's I true. That's true. That. I think one of the challenges we have seen in the UK has been the fragmentation. And what I'm hearing is that uh, people in general practice are finding it difficult to connect into the system to know who to call, who is in charge. This goes actually back to 1983 to the uh, Griffiths report and uh, the management of the NHS, who is actually in charge. So I think that has not particularly helped in all of this. Uh, there's a lot of goodwill, there's a lot of competence. We have very good primary care compared to many countries, but we, have a very frag we now have a very fragmented system. Okay, so we are coming to the end, but to several people now, um, uh, I can't read their names out, uh, Deirdre McKenna, etc. And this is, I think, for, for, firstly for, for you, Martin, probably. Um, you, of course, are not a great fan of Brexit. I don't think you're revealing any state secrets about that. But do you think the UK capacity um, to uh, collaborate and, and defeat the coronavirus will be hampered uh, by, by Brexit? I think it already has been. I think there's pretty clear evidence of that. The fact that we were not fully engaged with other countries in the discussions, that changed relatively early on and some of the discussions did take place. And of course there are individual links between, for example, scientists in PHE and the Robert Koch Institute Indeed. and elsewhere. But simply not being in the room where different ideas are being discussed is a major problem. We still have the story of the missing emails in terms of the joint procurement agreement. We really don't know what's going on there. And remember that we are heading rapidly for a no deal Brexit at the end of the year. Uh, people tend not to pick up on that because it's being submerged in all of the other news. And we're in danger of having a catastrophe uh, in terms of access to medicines, food, and all sorts of other things in the middle of winter, which could easily come in the middle of a second wave. So I think uh, mm. I would be very, very worried indeed. Natasha, is it fair to bring you in on our own private grief? Well, in, in my... Uh... In my youth and uh, in my early career, I lobbied extensively for, for Malta to become a member of the European Union. So that, that's where I stand. I'm a firm believer that the European Union does have a lot to offer. I was a bit disappointed in previous years when it seemed as though health was slipping off the agenda. And that may well have been one of the reasons why people were becoming increasingly disenfranchised with the European Union. And I think as a result of COVID, perhaps one of the positive outcomes that we may see is that um, uh, health will be on the agenda. I think personally um, that uh, the EU will also lose a lot from Britain leaving in the health um, arena, um, uh, British uh, professionals in public health and in, in, in research have contributed immensely. So unfortunately, it is a situation, I think, where everybody's going to lose, sadly, in the end. Yes, well, okay, a rather sad note, but I have to say, as we move into the greatest recession since 1703, it does seem strange to be hurtling towards a, a, a no-deal Brexit. Maybe the Royal College of Lemmings will be pleased with that, but nobody else will. Okay then, so we have to call a halt there. So my thanks, obviously, to our two speakers. My thanks also to the Royal Society of Medicine for continuing to support this. My thanks to you for listening. And do feel, uh, if you feel like contributing to us, please do. Now, next in the COVID seri series of health professionals by health professionals, that's in two days' time, Thursday at 12.30. The theme will be uh, BAME issues. And then uh, our own Sarah Filson uh, will be in the chair talking to Kevin Fenton from PHE and Dame Donna Kinnear who of course is the chief exec of the RCN. And our more leisurely in conversation series will continue tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. I'll be talking to journalist and documentary maker, Jane Corbyn. So Natasha, Martin, thank you so much. And uh, we very much want to bring you back to our end of uh, month roundup of these issues, because I can see there are huge areas of interest by everybody watching, listening and watching uh, around what's happening in Europe um, that we haven't managed to cover. But then, as I say, um, in the words now of President Macron, sois prudent. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you.